very much, Mary, for the introduction. And it's great to be here in Galway and also connecting with so many people online. Um, hopefully the first of many hybrid conferences for us. So what I'm going to do is set out a high-level overview of the state of Ireland's um, water environment, drawing on our latest data, science and evidence, and talk through the pressures that are impacting on our water quality in a little bit more detail, which will hopefully set the scene for, for the next two days, for the other presentations, discussions and deliberations. So when we look at water quality overall in Ireland, and Laura has, has introduced this, we do see a concerning picture. About 50% of our rivers and lakes are in an unsatisfactory condition. And that is even more concerning when we look into our estuaries at only 38% satisfactory. When you compare that with coastal groundwaters canals, they are showing a slightly better picture, 80, 90% in satisfactory conditions. So really, the issues related to fresh waters, estuaries around the country. And we can see from the map on the right that those issues are widespread across the country, and that's those shown in the colours red, brown and yellow. What we're trying to get to by 2027 is that that map only shows green and blue, which is good and high quality water status. And that is really kind of highlighting the, the, the extent of the challenge that we face over the next number of years. And when we look over time, the trends have been going in the wrong direction for water quality. This shows the trends from 2007 up to 18. We've been losing our high status water bodies, so that has implications, for example, for the survival of sensitive species like freshwater pearl mussel. And we've also been seeing an increase in the water bodies that are assigned poor status. So this really gets to the heart of what we need to do within um, Ireland and in addressing our objectives under the, wa the Water Framework Directive, which is to hold what we have and maintain what we have in terms of good and high water quality and then restore those water bodies that have been allowed to deteriorate due to pollution and human intervention. And looking still at the trends, one of the most dramatic trends is the, de the decline that we've seen in our most pristine rivers, which have decreased from about 500 in the 1990s down to 20 in this most latest image, which runs up to 2018. And certainly it's very welcome to see the launch of the Waters of Life um, research programme in the last number of weeks, which is looking at exactly this issue and addressing you know, why are we seeing this change of status in these most pristine waters and bringing forward potential solutions that can be implemented in Ireland. So what is actually impacting on our water quality? And Laura has, has um, um, touched on these in her opening remarks. And this slide is showing the main pressures on our water environment and compares the second cycle with the assessments that are underpinning the third, the draft third um, river basin management plan. So agriculture is the most widespread pressure and it is increasing. We can see that in this slide and now impacting a thousand water bodies in the country. And the main issue there being runoff from nutrients, nitrates, phosphates um, into our waterways. The second most um, widespread pressure relates to hydromorphology. So this describes changes to the shape, the flow of waterways due to works, for example, due to physical barriers like weirs and dams. And this is an area where we have been developing a lot of capability and capacity within the EPA in the last number of years, which may explain the increase that we're seeing in terms of now over 400 water bodies impacted by, by, hydromorph impacted by hydromorphology. That may explain the increase that we're seeing um, in terms of 400 water bodies now being impacted, um, but nonetheless an area that um, is now really moving into a focus and attention and needs to be addressed. And then the third most widespread pressure relating to wastewater discharges. And a slightly more positive picture here in that we're seeing a decrease on the pressure exerted by wastewater discharges between the second and the third cycle um, river basin management plan um, period. Um, but yet, nonetheless, 200 water bodies um, experiencing wastewater discharges as a significant pressure, or as, a, as, a, as a pressure on them. 
So delving into the, the nutrients then in a little bit more detail, what is actually happening there, and I'll deal first and talk a little bit about nitrates. And the main source of nitrates are agricultural runoff from the application of fertilizer, manures on land, and also from wastewater discharges. And we can see from the, the pie, the donut chart on the left, that nearly half of our rivers have nitrate levels that are too high. And there, those issues, those problems are not spread uniformly around the country. We're actually seeing particular issues in the east, the southeast and the south. And that's shown in the map in the middle, the color is red and orange, indicating where there are particular um, problems with nitrates. And that's really where we're seeing the land in Ireland being most intensively farmed, coupled with freely draining soils where the nitrates are seeping off the land into our groundwater, rivers and into our estuaries and, and many of the problems manifesting in terms of nuisance blooms in those areas. We know from our assessment that about 85% of the nitrate in, those, in some of those catchments is, is coming from agriculture. And many of those rivers experiencing an increasing trend in nitrate levels. That's shown in the map on the right, and that's by the colours in red. And, and orange, we're seeing nitrate level trends increasing, about a third of our rivers experiencing an increasing nitrate trend, and that now very much a focus of the fifth Nitrates Action Programme that Laura mentioned um, in her opening remarks, and really looking at this in more detail and bringing um, uh, the full suite of enforcement measures, including advice, but right through to um, enforcement and strength and enforcement regime to tackle that. So phosphate can also be a nutrient of concern, the main source of phosphate. Again, agricultural runoff, this time in poorly draining soils, and also um, released from, from wastewater discharges. And we see the image on the left, the donut on the left, showing that nearly 30% of our rivers have phosphate levels that are too high. And again, not those issues aren't spread uniformly around the country. We are seeing particular problems in the east, parts of the northeast, and also parts of the south. Um, we know from our analysis about half of the phosphate levels are coming from wastewater discharges and about half coming from agricultural activity. And again, many rivers experiencing an increasing trend in phosphate, which is shown in the map on the right. So the red, the orange showing increasing levels of phosphates, about a quarter of our rivers um, is experiencing that increasing trend. And a difficult area to tackle, really, phosphorus losses, particularly from agriculture, are diffuse. They come from many different sources. And really, it's about getting an understanding of where are the high-risk areas, what are the critical areas where we need to focus our attention. And that has really been much of the focus of the EPA's work over the last number of years, is getting a better spatial understanding of what's happening around the country and how does that um, combine um, with the local geology, with local farming practices, for example, and um, with weather, and how can all of that information be used together to inform and support policymakers as they're designing um, measures to tackle these issues. <clears throat> So the second most widespread pressure relates to hydromorphology. As I say, this refers to changes in the shape, the flow of water bodies due to channelization, drainage, for example, also physical barriers like weirs, dams. It is an area where we have spent quite a lot of time building our capacity in the EPA so that we can get a better understanding of what's actually happening around the country in relation to hydromorphology. And we know now that about 400 water bodies um, need improvements and are feeling a pressure from hydromorphology. And that again, the actions to address these will need to be targeted. And much of the science and the tools and the assessments that we're doing in the EPA will help that action to be targeted and will also help inform future regulatory regimes around um, heavily modified water bodies, which um, <clears throat> have been um, committed to within the draft um, river basin management plan. And then the third area relating to, to wastewater discharges, about 200 water bodies still need action in relation to um, our, our urban wastewater. We have seen some improvements in these areas. We have seen the number of plants on our priority list decreasing over time, and that is possible 
positive, but there still is, is a way to go on this. And for us, the, the priority will be to align Irish Water's investment cycle with our own priority action list, with our objectives under the Water Framework Directive to ensure that those plants that um, can deliver most in terms of envir environmental benefits are actually being upgraded um, and delivered. So changing tack a little bit now, this, this graph shows more recent data that we've published this year. So this refers to river Q values. So this really is giving a picture of the biological quality of our rivers. It's not a full status assessment, which will come later in the years, but does give you a good indication of what's happening in terms of the biological quality within a river. And if we look at the top line, 2019 to 2021, what we can see really overall the message is we seem to be seeing some, bio, some stabilization of biological quality within rivers. We have a slight increase in high status water bodies and a decrease in those that are, are designated um, bad, which is positive. But overall, a net improvement of 61 rivers in terms of status. And while that is good, there is a net improvement, you have 413 improvements versus 352 declines. So, you know, all of those improvements have um, been undermined and, and um, eroded, if you like, on the other side with, um, with the declines. And this, this graph shows the same information in a different way. About 1,500 rivers um, have unchanged status. To the left, we see the declines by one, two, and three classes. And nearly matched, okay, it's a, a net improvement of 61, but, but, but the improvements nearly matching the declines. And really what comes to mind to me when I see this slide is, is, is running fast to stand still and really makes it um, even more challenging to, uh, to achieve our environmental objectives under the Water Framework Directive. And again, another changing tack, another bit through here on this slide, I just want to mention our bathing water report, which was published last Friday. More positive news here in that nearly 80% of our bathing waters achieved excellent classification, indeed 97% um, meeting the minimum requirements. And we're attributing those improvements that we've seen gradually over the years to improve management of our bathing waters by local authorities, as well as the investment that we're seeing in our public urban wastewater infrastructure. So, so that is good news, but we do know that bathing water quality is variable, can change in particular in the short term, and we need to be vigilant in terms of addressing agricultural runoff, particularly after heavy rainfall, um, continued sustained investment in our, our wastewater infrastructure, as well as dealing with contamination, fouling from dogs and animals on beaches, which is a particular issue around the country. And my final slide then, I just want to touch on climate and the, the interrelationship as, as Laura was um, um, talking about in her opening remarks between many environmental issues. And we're increasingly seeing the interconnection between a changing climate and the management of our water resources. The IPCC in their publications this year, last year, have highlighted that we are underestimating the impact of a changing climate on ecosystems, on water quality. And, and this is something that we are very much um, alive to and aware in the EPA. The short-term impacts in Ireland would be increased precip precipitation, extreme weather events that we've seen over the years, um, drought risks we saw then 2018, flooding, for example. But we know that if we have more water bodies in a good and high-quality status, they would better be able to withstand the pressures that would be brought to bear in a changing climate. And so um, the interrelationship between climate, water management, very much at the forefront of our minds. And we are looking at our, our water monitoring programme this year to see how it needs to be evolved and adapted so that we are tracking the impact of climate and as, it, and as we experience a certain amount of climate change, how that will impact on our water quality overall. And that brings me to the end of my presentation, just to run through some of the, the main points. Our water quality needs to improve. We are seeing some trends going in the wrong direction. And the targets to address those, me to, to address those trends will, or the measures to address those, those, those trends will need to be targeted. We know that in terms of our work in the EPA, in terms of addressing agricultural impacts, in terms of addressing hydro hydromorphology, 
There has been some progress on wastewater, but there is a lot more to do, and we need to see that continued and sustained investment with water quality and protection of health at the centre of that, and looking, out, looking at climate and the interrelationship between the management of our water resources and, and climate change in Ireland, ensuring we have high quality waters means that we'll be better able to, or are more resilient into the future, as well as ensuring that our infrastructure is um, future proofed. So thank you very much, and I look forward to the discussion later on.